Hi everyone, greetings from National Skills Network. This is Madhuri and I am here to introduce you to the conversation we have had on NEP 2020 and its implementation. As we know, the policy has a huge potential to transform the educational landscape in India by integrating it with work integrated education, skill based learning and many other innovative aspects. So it is in this context that I caught up with Professor Neelima Gupta, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Hari Singh Gaur Vishwavidyalay, Sagar Madhya Pradesh. So let's go ahead and watch this conversation and pick up important points that she is sharing about how the policy has been implemented and also various references to the supporting frameworks like the credit framework, the NSQF levels and so on. So ma'am, let me get started by asking you, uh, there is a lot of buzz about NEP 2020 and uh, also there are a lot of uh, you know, media articles and uh, events and discussions about NEP, NCRF, uh, NCVET and frameworks and so on. So in one word, uh, how would you want to summarize this? Is NEP going to be like a revolution or is it going to be like an evolution? Uh, well, Madhuri ji, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to your National Skills uh, Network. And I see that uh, you are contributing a lot in the field of education by uh, sharing these types of videos and news uh, to all the stakeholders. Uh, uh, when uh, talking about NEP 2020, uh, I must say that uh, it has brought about uh, a revolution in, in the entire education system. Because at one time, because if I just try to recall the times when we were studying, then it was uh, simply classes, lectures, examinations, uh, evaluations, and degrees, which we could get. And we came out into the market. Uh, we did not get any uh, type of skill training during our courses. And we had to face the society or the market on our own. But right. now with this uh, uh, national education policy, uh, it has uh, given us uh, uh, some uh, guidelines as to how we can change the entire education system. Because as we know, we have a very vast education system with uh, more than 1,000 universities here in our country, with more than 11,000 standalone universities, more than 40,000 colleges which are present here, yeah. more, uh, more than 300 affiliating universities. So such a huge education system, if we try to compare it, because often a, a question comes that why is the education system in other countries so successful? Uh, and why we have to struggle so much? I think the basic thing is that we, because we have so many students here to cater to, it is a very big education system, one of the biggest education systems of the world. And therefore, of course, we, we must be having problems. So when this uh, national education policy came to us, uh, now it it is basically this policy is divided into four parts. First part deals with school education. The second part deals with university education. The third part deals with the key areas of focus. And uh, the fourth part, which you are talking about, is making it happen. That is how yeah. to make it happen in different colleges, universities, and how it can become successful. Yeah. So I would say, uh, regarding your first question, which has been put forth to me, that it is uh, indeed a very big revolution which has come about. And together with it, it is not all revolution or evolution, but I would say that it is revolution plus evolution. We are evolving also yes. in our education system and we are looking towards the betterment. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah. So since you said it's evolution and evolution uh, cannot happen without change. And uh, this mm -hmm. is a big exercise in changing. And uh, I think it's also an exercise in change management. It has its own challenges. There is resistance. There are questions. Uh, there are a lot of things which are coming up, especially from the implementation point of view. Uh, so, And also, for instance, if we look at one of the important aspects in higher education, uh, we are talking about uh, multidisciplinary courses mm -hmm. uh, and flexible entry exit. And uh, there are few such crucial 
changes you just mentioned like uh, our education system has a lot of scope to improve and uh, you know be the best in the world but since the diversity is so much in our country and the kind of views we get from other universities what's your take on uh, these important things like multidisciplinary curriculum uh, multiple entry exit or any of those uh, the new things that have been uh, suggested and uh, introduced in the policy uh, well, I think this is also related to the first answer which I gave you. And let me yeah. begin with that since we are also talking about evolution. Is that uh, we have a large number of students. And right. when we talk about this large number of uh, students, they also obviously come from different sectors of the society. Right. And when they are coming from six different sectors of the society, suppose a student takes an admission in a common course, BA course, Bachelor of Arts. He completes first year and then he drops out or his parents get transferred, or he decides, oh, I did not like this course. So in all these cases, we have dropouts. So right now we are having a large number of dropouts also. With yeah. this policy, that is a national education policy, uh, two things which you're talking about, uh, multidisciplinary education uh, and ABC, that is the Academic Bank of Credits. Well, yeah. this multiple entry, multiple exit. So this is like in our universities, different university commonly. I mean, if it is a three-year course, you have to complete it in five years or six years. After that, after seven years, you say bye-bye to the student. And you say now the doors are closed for you and you cannot get the degree. So that poor fellow who studied for one year or two years, uh, he ha he's just on the road. So now this policy, that is multiple entry, multiple exit, in this you can just uh, get an entry. It's not necessary that you complete your three-year course. You can do a certificate course. In one year, you get a certificate. You can move out. If you have two years uh, in hand, you can get a diploma. If you have three years, you can get a degree. If you have four years now, because UG, as per NEP, it is uh, proposed to be for four years. So you can get an honors degree and you're fit for research also. Mm -hmm. So now this uh, multiple entry, multiple exit is just as per your choice. You come in and you go out so anywhere, uh, wherever you feel like. So there is uh, no foundation between uh, any student. And second thing which is related with uh, multidisciplinary education is that uh, uh, now, like uh, if I talk about arts, you can take only, suppose, history, you can take economics, you can take psychology, you can take English, you can take Hindi, but an art student cannot take physics in right. the old system. Yes. Uh, an art student cannot take a commerce paper. So now with this flexibility now, uh, in multidisciplinary education, you can also take um, other courses from uh, different streams. So, and then now uh, related to it is academic bank of credits. Now, what we do in this academic bank of credits is that we can deposit, just like you deposit money, you can deposit your academic credits. And in this way, uh, if a student is transferred from one university or he uh, decides to uh, study further in another university, he can simply borrow his academic credits. Yeah. And this he can go on accumulating. And by the time he has fulfilled the desired number of credits, it may be from any university. Yeah. This was not present earlier. So when he is able to do this, uh, he completes the number of credits and then he will get a degree. And then those old credits, they become exhausted because he has utilized those credits. So now right. this, uh, according to this policy, uh, we are trying to do these registrations. And as you said that you want examples from our university also. So today our number is uh, 7,873 or something as my office has informed me. And we are doing this ABC uh, uh, registrations here in our university. So now uh, uh, people are not aware about ABC because there were when it started, uh, there was a lot of confusion. So we have our media center here also in our university. We have made two promos. Uh, th that is on ABC, uh, how to popularize it. We have put it on our website and when we sent it to the UGC chairman, he also liked it and he has circulated to all the universities. So now what we have to do is that we have to uh, publicize, like you are asking these questions and it is the same question which is being raised in the minds of the students. They yes. also do not know how we can be benefited by multidisciplinary uh, education. What is ABC? How can we deposit credits? And right now, universities are depositing, uh, are doing the registrations. But there are very few examples when where these credits are being transferred from one university to, to the other. But I think this that this is a preliminary stage. Yeah. So uh, here, uh, I think that in this system, we were very much worried about two things. One was our dropouts. And yeah. second thing, uh, improve in our gross enrollment ratio. 
So I think with this system, we will be able to uh, reduce our dropouts and we will be able to improve our gross enrollment ratio as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think this is a very big move towards that, ma'am. And uh, also another thing is, uh, like also like uh, if somebody has a genuine reason to drop out, let's say, you know, uh, get started with some kind of work, take up a job and then, you know, try to continue. So it helps in many ways. Uh, but mm -hmm. the other side is like what we, uh, in my interactions with several people, like I said, uh, we conduct few workshops also on this. The question mostly is like, how practical is it? What kind of changes do we make? Uh, like, for example, if somebody has to take admission in some other university based on credits, uh, how do you ensure that the quality or the outcome because learning outcome is another important aspect from the national uh, higher education qualification framework uh, mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. um, how do we gradually implement this this into a system uh, mm -hmm. which has kind of been somewhat same over the last i think from 1986 or even before that right so this is a very big change mm -hmm. so what would be your suggestion to bring in this comfort level or the confidence for us to take that step? Uh -huh. It's a very good, good question. And I think there's a lot of substance in it because we have such a variety of universities. We yeah. have uh, state universities, we have central universities, we have deemed universities, we have private universities. So all these different universities, uh, there is no uniformity in these courses. And that's mm -hmm. my concern also, that when a student does a credit from one university and we try to transfer it. So right now it is very objective. And looking into this, uh, I think what the UGC has recently done, it has come out with the National Higher Education Qualification Framework. Yeah. So that is NHEQF. So this talks about the, the variations. This is, um, I think it is linked up with this variation in the type of uh, HEIs or higher educational institutions and uh, which uh, results in a lack of comparability between these institutions. So this uh, policy which is uh, coming up, it is, uh, um, and not only in our country, if you try to compare it with uh, other countries, then this question becomes even more grave. And uh, right now, like Association of Indian Universities, it is doing this uh, equivalence. It has an equivalence committee. So these degrees which are being awarded by foreign universities, how much they are equivalent in ours. And if we talk about our country, of course, there is, uh, again, a, a very big variety in uh, uh, the uh, level of the teaching and the level of the courses which are uh, going on. But this policy provides a nationally acceptable uh, type of provision and which is internationally comparable and the acceptable qualifications uh, in the form of a framework. And it, uh, this will be taken up at uh, higher education qualifications at uh, all levels. But since it is at the preliminary stage, we have to do a lot in uh, doing this homework so that this uh, compatibility or comparability between different universities and between the different courses, mm -hmm. it can be resolved. Yes, yeah, so uh, it means that we are on the path now towards, uh, you know, where we can look at uh, uh, some kind of, uh, I would say, parity or some equivalence and other aspects, right? Where right. we are able to uh, provide these credits and recognize those credits. But mm -hmm. uh, aren't we at a very nascent stage right now in this kind of thought process? I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's yeah. what I said. Yeah. Uh, we are still at the seedling stage. Yeah. So, uh, so what would be your idea about uh, creating awareness? Like you already mentioned that uh, your university has created some educational, uh, you know, videos which can sensitize people. Do you yeah. think we are making enough, uh, we're taking like, you know, enough, uh, uh, I would say putting in enough efforts in this. And another important aspect uh, here is, um, the vocationalization, right, uh, in the mm -hmm. higher education, which I think is being uh, done for the very first time in a very big way, where we are talking about integrating apprenticeships, job-oriented courses and all. So, mm -hmm. and then the other uh, party, the other stakeholder is the industry. Right. So, uh, maybe you can share your views on how this sensitization can happen, what are the issues we are facing in awareness creation, mm -hmm. how open are people to even participate in such conversations at this point in time? Uh, well, I don't think we have a very good state of affairs right now. Mm. 
that many of the people have not even read the NEP 2020 completely. Mm -hmm. Because in many of the meetings, when I ask that, uh, just uh, please let me know how many of you have read the entire NEP 2020. Yeah. So I find not even half of them have uh, read the entire NEP. Mm -hmm. So I was only yesterday, we were in a meeting. I said that first of all, we must have these sensitizing uh, uh, workshops, yeah. uh, maybe online workshops where at least every teacher, every faculty member, every administrator should know about what is NEP 2020. Yeah. We have to begin from there. What right now we are doing is that that phase we have crossed. And we are trying to implement the policies. So without knowing the baseline of NEP 2020, we are trying to implement them. And that is why we are not being very successful. Yes. So we have to start from NEP 2020 only, not presuming that everybody knows about it. Yes. And then taking up like uh, the sensitization part, it has to be taken on a very large scale. Hmm. Uh, of course, the universities are trying a lot. The government is trying a lot. UGC is also trying uh, Ministry of Education is also trying different policies are coming out and they are trying to help us out but yeah. the thing is that we do not take out uh, these policies we do not try to read them and we just think of uh, trying to implement them so what we did we made a framework and in that framework because now you were talking about skill uh, we have to introduce skill so we have uh, introduced ability uh, enhancement programs we mm. have uh, introduced value added courses and we have introduced skill based courses mm. and we have decided them semester wise so for each depart department we have a framework and de depending on that we have framed our courses so i think that's a better way of proceeding towards implementation instead of framing the what universities are doing they're trying to frame the courses first they have yeah. made a scale then how do, should the students uh, opt because now we have a wide range of courses and we also have to, uh, because the, the common question which comes is that if we give so many options, where do we get the teachers? How do we arrange the classes? Yes. So you know, this is a practical problem. We, it is very good to say on the papers and like ours is also a very big university, but we are facing this crunch. But how to arrange these teachers, how to arrange the timetable where each student can get uh, any course of his liking. Mm -hmm. So uh, this way, uh, we have to be very careful in the planning part. First, have a framework of what yeah. courses we are going to take up, how we are going to distribute them, because we have distributed them semester wise. Let's say, for example, skill based courses we are taking in the second semester, ability we are taking in the third semester. That way we have divided. Each university can make its own framework. And then to fit in this, we have now a, a choice of these are the uh, different types of courses which ha have been floated. And now the student can opt for these courses and then we can have those classes. So we have to move in this direction. Mm -hmm. Now coming to skill, now this skill now it becomes related with industry. Yeah. So right now, uh, if we talk about the past, we had no link with the industry at all. Hmm. We were only having universities or industries. Universities were not interested in industries. Industries were not interested in universities. Now, yeah. gradually, universities with this policy, we started becoming interested in industries. Industries are still not interested. What is their concern? But their concern comes in because when they try to find hands, uh, they do not get hands. And we try to find expertise of the industry, we do not get so that is the reason why we have started now collaborations, MOUs with industries, mm -hmm. which many of the universities are doing. But how far it is being implemented, how far they are gaining benefit from the industry, that is yet to be worked out. So I would suggest that each university must also have an MOU monitoring committee, which I have done here in our university. So we periodically try to find what have you done? How many collaborations? How did you move forward? So yeah. you have to move in that direction. And then uh, uh, these uh, industry, if uh, we want to have a vibrant uh, university industry linkage, uh, we have to uh, uh, really interact with these industries. And uh, this uh, now, as we call as UI, that is university industry uh, collaboration, I have seen. And in that, I would say that the private universities are going much ahead mm -hmm. because they are trying to uh, collaborate with the industries. And these industries, even um, many of these industries are uh, making their centers in the university. Yeah. This is a very big move. Mm -hmm. I must say, and all universities should uh, uh, try in this direction. So I was just going through some of the universities, like they have uh, um, uh, centers established by Microsoft uh, Innovation Center in the university. Mm -hmm. They have a Cisco Networking Academy, which is present in their university, Videocon Connect, 
Hyundai Professional Development Center, IBM Software. So all these industries, they have entered the university premises. So they are running their industries and the students are available in the university. So there they get all their trainings and all. And the industry also tries to select out the best, which is good for them. Right. And so they are getting their learning skills. They're getting employment. The industries, they are uh, getting the students or hands who can work for their industries. So I think we should uh, move uh, in this direction so that we get a good uh, um, a skill uh, sets. Second thing which we can do is that uh, we can have uh, R&D clusters, which right. we can have at the state level also. And here I have proposed several times, even DST is running some of these like Sathi project and all, in mm. which uh, several universities, five universities, they can join together and they can share their research and skill abilities uh, with each other. So mm. if we can move, because all these things are there, we have started working on these. But uh, how far we are able to uh, make them successful is that we have to uh, move in this direction. And I would suggest that the university should also collaborate with MSMEs, that is a micro, small and medium enterprises. Mm. I did this earlier. I was vice chancellor at Kanpur University. So there we did a collaboration with MSME and I could get two projects where they sponsored 25 students for each batch. So uh, they gave money and all also. So we must uh, also establish industry relations cell in our university and university relations cell. So if we have these two cells, they can yeah. cater to these needs and they can do the work. Each cell is responsible either for maintaining relations with industry or uh, um, relations with, uh, with, with the different types of industry. I think if we move in this direction, maybe we our success rate can improve. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that's a very positive way of, uh, you know, and creating this ecosystem, I think, ma'am, which is, right. again, you know, quite a new thing. And especially in the higher education segment, where we are talking about making it skill oriented, mm -hmm. like you were just talking about how it can address the skill gaps, yeah. right, uh, for various job roles, and that too proactively. Uh -huh. I think this is a very important thing. And this is where I think uh, we will actually uh, you know, justify that, you know, this kind of a relationship will go beyond placements. Otherwise, right. today, if you mm -hmm. look at in industry and academia collaboration, it is mostly we talk about placements. And right. of course, there could be curriculum and other things, but it has to go deeper. Right. So uh, since you already mentioned about few courses, which your university has started, let me ask you now, uh, more from the point of view of developing new type courses and curriculum, where, you know, the faculty, uh, the uh, seniors who are there, you know, the heads of the departments and others will play a very important role. So do you see that there is a need to orient the faculty? Uh, I think you mentioned this already. Uh, all the teaching staff and then uh, others who are connected uh, to execute these courses, design these courses, and then bring the industry people perhaps, because mm -hmm. we are not talking only pure academic curriculum now in the new policy. Most mm -hmm. of it is also going to be work oriented, right? Mm -hmm. So how did it go in your university and what would be your suggestions if others are interested mm -hmm. to take this further? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in, uh, like uh, we, I would suggest that every university or college or institution must have an NEP implementation cell oh. and appoint a coordinator first of all. Mm -hmm. So uh, he or she should be responsible for that. This is what we did here in our university. And then we can have a full team. And this interest has to be aroused in, uh, it is of course all the head of the departments who had to come together. And in fact, it is not only the head of the departments, each member of the department has mm -hmm. to play a role. Mm -hmm. And here the importance of the teacher comes into play because uh, uh, these teachers, like I told you, they might not be having a background, such a type of background. Yeah. But there is one very good quality of a teacher that he or she always tries to learn. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because I myself have seen in my time a revolution in the entire teaching system and uh, we are adjusting to the new system. So I feel that uh, these uh, teachers, if they take up this uh, responsibility of designing new curricula, we did this in our university and we have a full library of courses which have been floated. And I'm very happy that we have already conducted the first batch of NEP uh, based syllabus examination. Um, last year this is our second batch which is running so and is exactly based on the NEP pattern so um, I would say that uh, we have to these teachers they have to come forward and uh, like I said earlier that we have to have a framework 
and fitting into that framework, then I think it's very easy if you if you move in that direction and you move down and then at the departmental level, you say that each one of you has to give a skill-based course. Each one of you have to give an ability enhancement course. Each of one of you have to give a value-added course. You will have a full library of these courses. It's not difficult. Only yeah. that you have to plan it in a proper manner and each and every member of the faculty, they should take, play an active role in this process. And also, did you try integrating technology into this in the sense like, say, blended learning programs? Or did you have to kind of purchase some learning content or courses from elsewhere, which could be like e-learning? Yes. There's scope for that also, right? The teachers uh -huh. need not reinvent the wheel every right. time. Right. 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 <laughs> but but this, this work, I would say COVID was a very good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. 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 So COVID it, brought that instinct, you know. I think it would not have come otherwise. And it's a coincidence that COVID and the NEP 2020 came together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a very welcome coincidence, yeah, I think, yeah. uh, because yeah. I think COVID specially helped us uh, appreciate the value of technology. And yes. uh, it was not a threat, is what it taught us, especially uh -huh. to us teachers. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, but did you find any issues like, let's say, the uh, you know, how do you, I, I mean, change their mindset towards doing something new? What I mean, are they incentivized or is there something you can share on these lines about uh, motivating the faculty members to yeah. do research, to get into curriculum, uh, uh -huh. take up things which are non-core classroom uh, mm -hmm. teaching type, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. See, uh, you cannot, I think cannot, uh, I would not say the example of my university or any other university. I think universally, you don't find everybody who is very positive. But yeah. there are people who are positive and these yeah. positive people, they have to spread the message. Yeah. And now uh, one thing is there for sure that the teachers have realized that uh, now we have to move forward. We have to expand our wings and uh, we have to talk not only about our syllabus, but we have to have more of student interaction. We have to frame our curricula and all. So, uh, and here in comes the qualities of a teacher. And mm. today when we are talking about a teacher, I think four S in the life of a teacher are very important. That a teacher should be sincere towards his students. A teacher should be very much sincere towards his own self. That is, uh, he should be uh, knowing that I'm performing my duties. He should be uh, sincere towards his subject. Uh, because every time, like you say, evolution, the subjects are also evolving. And of course, because all our students are ultimately going to the society, the teacher should also be honest towards the society. Mm -hmm. So if a teacher keeps all these four S in his uh, mind, I'm sure that he can be an excellent teacher and the curriculum framework, thinking about the student's needs, catering to his needs, coming to experiential learning, blended mode of learning. Like you're talking about also how we went in for um, e-learning and all. We designed a number of new courses and we also have a media center. So in this uh, media center, we have uh, developed uh, MOOCs courses, which are uh, nationally, they have been adopted. Right now, also about a dozen of our MOOCs courses, they have been taken up by different students. So, and then uh, these teacher training programs, I would say that uh, earlier we had these academic staff colleges uh, of the UGC. Uh, then it uh, shifted to HRDC, that is the Human Resource Development Centers. And recently now they have all been converted into the Malvia Mission Teachers Training Centers. Yeah. We have also uh, renamed uh, our HRDC now. So the purpose of these centers is to train these teachers. And we get very good teachers. For the new teachers, we have induction programs. For uh, the uh, 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 more senior teachers, we have these refresher programs teacher trainings programs, even on NEP, we conducted a series of these uh, programs. So if, uh, and now, uh, uh, since we have all become so familiar, like you and me are also talking online, uh, we, we can always have these online uh, programs. And uh, I think it is very easy now to uh, inculcate these feelings. Right. But uh, the thing is that we must move on. We should not stand still. We must move on and spread this message of NEP 2020 so that we can get success. Yeah, definitely, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. One important point I would like you to maybe dwell a little more is the NCRF. Uh -huh. The credit framework, you already mentioned about credits. Mm -hmm. uh, 
now where do you see us going with this uh, do you think this is already getting implemented in the wider set of institutions or are there challenges uh, as far as we understand or i also as i said work actively in this domain uh, mm -hmm. i see a lot of people very curious about how it works uh -huh. when we tell them that 30 hours is this or uh, you know practicals is so many hours or how one can accumulate uh, mm -hmm. so what is your opinion on really implementing credit framework across, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, bringing the NSQF uh, mm -hmm. kind of framework and the higher education uh, closer, mm -hmm. maybe? Yeah, yeah. I, I already yeah. gave you a hint in the yeah. beginning somewhere during my talk. But let me go a little deeper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, talking, uh, talking about the national credit framework, it is an inclusive one single meta framework. Oh. That, first of all, we must uh, understand. And this meta uh, framework, uh, it uh, within this framework, we find uh, NHEQF also, that is the National Higher Education Qualifications Framework, which I also shared with you. We also have the NSQF framework, that is uh, uh, the National Skill Qualification Framework, which talks right. about the skill. And we also have the NCF or the National Credit Framework. So yeah. this, all these three, they, they uh, come uh, together. And uh, um, as I said, that it is a single meta framework. And I still feel that people are uh, not very well familiar with this uh, system because it's uh, comparatively new. But I must say that it would become a game changer because what earlier we were talking about, it may be multidisciplinary education. It may be multiple exit or entry uh, system. It may be ABC uh, or the Academic Bank of Credits. Or in other words, I would say uh, what uh, NEP talks about, and I think we did not talk anything about it, is holistic development. Yeah. This holistic development, I think uh, it will be a creative uh, type of combination between different subjects and disciplines. And this uh, national credit framework, I think uh, people are not much uh, aware uh, and how it should be taken forward. But uh, if people are able to understand it, I would suggest that these guidelines are already available on the UGC website. Yeah. So for all those who are interested in implementing um, NEP 2020, please go through these guidelines which are available on uh, the UGC website also on the net. That is the National Credit Framework. You just It is a big framework, but if you just go through five or six pages of its executive summary, I think the things will become very clear. Similarly, about the National Higher Education Qualification Framework. So this has now become a nationally accepted and internationally comparable uh, fra qualification framework. Because uh, as I was telling you that uh, qualifications may be different. Now we are talking about uh, transfer of credits also, uh, how to redeem these uh, credits also. So uh, how can we have a comparable, and, and it was one of your question, how can we have a comparable and acceptable qualification framework? So this talks about, we have to go through NHEQF also very carefully. This is also available on uh, the UGC website. Right. And also this uh, the National Skill Qualification Framework, which has been gazetted uh, by the Ministry of Finance, that is also available. And uh, once... So, I mean, you or me talking, of course, it can give an idea. But once you are thinking of implementing these policies, I would suggest that please go through these policies very carefully. And once you go through them, I think things will become very simple and we will be able to implement them in a proper manner. Okay, okay thank you, ma'am. Uh, but before closing, I would just like, uh, I would request you to kind of highlight three critical points uh, one has to keep in mind. Uh, you know, when, like you already mentioned most of them, when an institution, uh, whether it's a college or a school or a university is trying to look at implementing the ideas from the policy. And uh, mm -hmm. also in terms of awareness, uh, like, you know, most of them feel that it's some kind of a rule or regulation which has to be implemented. Then we have to tell them, no, a policy mm -hmm. is not like a uh, some kind of a rule that gets implemented across everywhere. But uh, de depending on the region, the state, the location, there is a huge, uh, you know, scope for making changes in the system. So mm -hmm. what would be those uh, three critical points they have to keep in mind? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, well, it was nice uh, talking to you, Madhuriji. And uh, the, I, if I just talk about the three takeaway points, I would say the NEP is uh, number one, it's a flexible system. And yeah. we have to be prepared for flexibility, which the policy uh, offers. 
Uh, second thing is uh, about the teacher quality and how much focus we have to give on human resources. Because if we want to implement this uh, policy, then we must have teachers because it is we just come down administrator and then second is teacher. So this yeah. teacher has to understand this policy and take it to the grassroots level. And the third is we have to take into consideration the importance of skill and industry linkage. Yeah. So um, I think we, of course, there are many avenues and we have to take each one into consideration. But these three, I feel, are the most important. And we must consider these uh, or rather take it inside, deep inside our minds that if we think of implementing NEP 2020, we must be prepared to have a flexible system. We must be prepared to have teachers of good qualities and who are ready to go in for the new system. And thirdly, we should uh, think of adopting skill-based education and linkage with the industry so that we can create students who are society ready. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Uh, from your leadership and in implementing, I think our audience is definitely going to gain a lot of uh, practical points. Thanks once again uh, for giving us your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Madhuri. Nice talking to you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm.